Hi, I'm Rebecca Ball Carcel. Let's talk about the poem, A Prayer for My Daughter by William Butler Yeats. And Yeats is how you pronounce it, even though it doesn't look like Yeats. <laughs> now Yeats is writing, um, well, he lives between like 18, end of the 1800s, early 1900s. And he's writing this poem when his daughter is just born. She's two days old and he's moved to write a poem about her future and what he hopes for her, what kind of life she should lead or what he hopes she'll do in life. And he's torn because I think he wants everything good for her and for him good means a very calm and settled life. And at the same time, he's living through turbulent times, through upheaval, uh, through even war. And he sees how radical ideas can be very energizing, liberating, and necessary, but at the same time, there are risks involved, and those aren't the kinds of things he wants for his daughter. So some people don't like this poem, because it does show a very tame kind of outcome for this little baby's life, as if he's pushing on her, you know, his idea of what a nice life would be, instead of letting her kind of blossom into the woman she's, you know, got gifts to become or something. So there is criticism about this poem, but I think you'll also hear a lot of love coming through. Let's get started. A prayer for my daughter. Once more the storm is howling, and half hid under this cradle hood and cover lid, my child sleeps on. So we're in the setting of a storm, and the storm is metaphoric and it can also be literal. There can be harsh weather outside, emphasizing the vulnerability of the little baby. And there's harsh weather metaphorically in terms of politics and disruption in Ireland, between Ireland and Britain, uh, Yeats being an Irish poet. So the politics of the day also are echoed in that idea of storm. So once more the storm is howling and half hid, lots of H's, under this cradle hood and cover lid. So this is where the baby's sleeping. My child sleeps on. A cover lid is a blanket. There is no obstacle but Gregory's wood and one bare hill, whereby the haystack and roof leveling wind bred on the Atlantic can be stayed. Okay, I'm stopping a lot, but I'll explain. He's living on uh, in a place where there's a wood nearby, that's a little forest, a bunch of trees that can break the wind. So the wind gets fierce on the Atlantic Ocean and it blows in. And here, the only thing between his little sweet baby and the wind is a wood, this forest, and then a bare hill. So it emphasizes the vulnerability of the child. And it says that the wind is roof leveling and haystack leveling. So it's a very strong wind. It brings those to the ground. So he says there's not much protection for the, from the wind. And for an hour I have walked and prayed because of the great gloom that is in my mind. So he's troubled as he thinks about the politics of the world, his own immediate circumstances, but the world in general, its dangers, um, its upheaval. He wishes for something more comfortable for her. Now let me point out some technical things that he's doing here. He's using rhyme, and I didn't read it with a lot of emphasis on the rhyme, but you have half hid, cover lid, um, you've got obstacle hill, uh, stayed and prayed, and roof leveling wind, and my mind. In America, we pronounce those words differently, but for his accent, those two words are closer to rhyming. So he has a stanza here of eight lines, and he actually keeps this pattern going, and he keeps the rhyme going. It's not super strict in terms of the rhythm, uh, the number of syllables and so forth. It's more or less equal. There's consistency there, but it's not uh, tied to the machine of da 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 although that under thread is there, or let me say, maybe that drum beat underneath is there in the lines. And he certainly is a formal poet in general, um, 
his other poems have similar forms, similar line lengths and syllable lengths. He uses rhyme. Okay, so back to the poem. So he feels this gloom in his mind as he looks at the world and looks at the sweet baby. He says, I have walked and prayed for this young child an hour and heard the sea wind scream upon the tower and under the arches of the bridge and scream in the elms above the flooded stream. Okay, so he's again setting the scene and he's saying that the wind has been howling. It's a sea wind screaming. That's a very dangerous sounding thing. And it screams upon the tower. So this is a very particular tower. He actually lives in a tower at this time of his life. He took an old tower, I mean, it's stone, rectangular thing with the little tiny windows, just like out of Lord of the Rings or, you know, medieval castle. And he lives there and he's had an architect help him make it livable, you know, make the windows a little bigger, turn the top level into living quarters. And they don't live there for very, very many years, but they live there at this point, and the tower then becomes a symbol of resisting that wind or protecting the baby from this scream of a wind. And uh, he also says that the wind goes under the arches of the bridge. This is a real bridge in Ireland near this tower. And uh, the wind goes there, and the elms, and a stream, and there really is water nearby. And while he's walking around and praying and thinking and hearing the wind, he goes on to say, imagining in excited reverie that the future years had come, dancing to a frenzied drum out of the murderous innocence of the sea. Woof, okay, so he imagines the future and he says, excited reverie. Normally we think of excited as happy, but this excitement is more of a stirred up, uh, troubling stirring up. Uh, you have Shakespeare using excitement in this way. If your mind is excited, it's troubled. It's, it's trying to figure things out that are very difficult. The mind that is excited is not at peace and not pleased, not happy, not calm, but is troubled and looking around for solutions where there might need not be any. So that's the kind of state he's in, and he has a reverie. And reverie seems like a positive word too, like, oh, I'm daydreaming. No, this is a, a reverie meaning just that he's imagining, he's picturing in his mind the future. And it's not a very nice future. Um, it's, it's uh, he mentions the murderous innocence of the sea. You know, the sea is innocent because it can't, with consciousness cause danger to humans and yet it does so life just brings you problems and that's just the way of things so Yeats is thinking that a troubled life is so easy to to have and a calm and beautiful life is so hard to have so he goes on may she be granted beauty and yet not beauty to make a stranger's eye distraught, or hers, before a looking-glass. For such, being made beautiful overmuch, consider beauty a sufficient end, lose natural kindness, and maybe the heart-revealing intimacy that chooses right, and never find a friend. For once I went through the whole stanza so you could hear it uh, unstopped, uninterrupted. So he decides to turn from the general troubles of the world to talk about beauty. He's hoping that she'll be beautiful, but not so beautiful that she focuses on outward appearance as the whole point of life. Because he says a stranger's eye can be distraught looking at her. So people can be struck by her beauty and then never really make a connection with her. Especially men can be struck by her beauty and then not get to know her in a, a more deep way. Also, beauty can make her own eye distraught, meaning that she can get obsessed with how she looks and spend a lot of time worrying about that instead of developing her other qualities. And if you're too beautiful, you can consider beauty a sufficient end 
end means goal. So if she thinks beauty is the whole goal of her life or the reason to exist, she's going to miss the point of life. So he doesn't want her to be that beautiful. <laughs> and especially because she'll lose natural kindness. So being too beautiful, uh, it just makes your life full of emphasis on the wrong things. He wants her to be kind. And being kind might be easier if you're not too beautiful. Okay. And heart-revealing intimacy that chooses right. That's what he wants for her. He doesn't want her to be without a true friend because everyone's just friends with her because she's beautiful. That kind of thing. All right, this is a pretty long poem, so I better keep moving. So speaking of beauty, Helen, he means Helen of Troy, right, from the Iliad. Helen, being chosen, found life flat and dull, and later had much trouble from a fool. While that great queen that rose out of the spray, being fatherless, could have her way, yet chose a bandy-legged smith for man. It's certain that fine women eat a crazy salad with their meat, whereby the horn of plenty is undone. Okay, so a little Greek mythology here, or, or history, depending on how you look at it. Helen of Troy was, um, you know, married but kidnapped for her beauty, and so a lot of trouble came to her because of her beauty. And then he mentions Venus, that queen that rose out of the spray. Legend has it she was born out of the sea on the spray of the sea. And being the goddess of beauty, Venus could have any man she wanted. But she chose Vulcan of all the men she could have. And he is just a uh, smith, meaning a blacksmith. He's in charge of making swords and things. So she was beautiful, but... Um, she she didn't actually choose someone beautiful t for her mate and then he says it's certain that fine women eat a crazy salad with their meat uh, so i guess he's saying that venus made an odd choice and so this is sort of crazy the crazy salad is just like her choice of what to go with her life is sort of inexplicable to him like why she made that choice and worse than just making kind of a weird choice is that this horn of plenty is undone. Now the horn of plenty, most of us think of like Thanksgiving where there's this cornucopia, this horn shaped basket with fruit in it and maybe vegetables like tumbling out of it, maybe squash and apples or something. That is a symbol not only of uh, like harvest abundance but more like life's abundance and the fruits of a good life, of a life well lived. And he wants his daughter to have those things. And beauty, like Helen or Venus, that just gets in the way. And it obscures the real goals of life and the rewards of a good life if you're focused on beauty. Next stanza. In courtesy, I'd have her chiefly learned. Hearts are not had as a gift, but hearts are earned by those that are not entirely beautiful. Yet many that have played the fool for beauty's very self has charm made wise. And many a poor man that has roved, loved, and thought himself beloved from a glad kindness cannot take his eyes. So here he's mentioning that wise women and charming women can eventually get the young man's attention. So if she's courteous, in courtesy I'd have her chiefly learned, so well-mannered, well-behaved, um, then she'll earn the love of someone because the heart is not a gift, it's earned. And he says that even people who aren't entirely beautiful can earn the, a heart through courtesy. And then he mentions the men who have played a fool for beauty actually come around like they act so stupid falling all over themselves for beautiful women but even they can be turned into more discerning men if they see a, a good woman basically the of the type he wants his daughter to be so the fool has been made wise um, through the charms of a kind woman a courteous woman and many a poor man has roved and loved and thought himself beloved so 
a man many times will, you know, wander around tr chasing love, but really it's not true love, it's just beauty, and when he realizes that that was shallow and it's not working out, then he comes back to kindness and can't take his eyes off of kindness. That that's what he's really looking for, even if he doesn't know it at first. So what does he want for his child so far? She needs to be a little bit beautiful, but not a lot. She needs to be courteous, wise, and kind. Okay, next stanza. 